All right. So, you know, just love chatting with you always and thought we would do a little intention before we mm-hmm. dive in and uh, want to ask, would you, would you like to lead it? Oh, uh, yeah. You, you kind of surprised me with that. Set our attention for our conversation. Yeah. Let's, if you want to do it and then I'll add to it. I know I'm totally putting you on the, on the spot here. Mm, yeah, um, sure. I mean, I think uh, as we're talking, we're talking uh, two days after uh, the shooting in the elementary school that happened in Texas. Mm. We're, we're talking, I guess, about a month since um, it was uh, leaked from the Supreme Court that they are likely going to make a decision that overturns Roe versus Wade, where um, Russia's at war with Ukraine. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion in the world at the moment. People are, I've been talking to a lot of people who are confused and um, about their personal lives and, and the world in general. So um, um, maybe if we were to set an intention, we would set an intention that we, um, uh, that something we say um, will help to uh, help people to understand their relationship to themselves and to the world in such a way that both brings them peace and makes them useful and um, of help to the world that they care about. Mm. All right, my friend, I've got nothing to add to that. That's really powerful. That was, and that, (laughs) that was off the cuff. So I just want to say, I don't even know what would happen if you'd planned. That was beautiful. Yeah. If I planned it, it would have been no good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, I appreciate you just taking it, working with it. That was really, really powerful. And I think, uh, you know, really setting that intention that everyone has that, um, has, has hope and alignment and peace and connected to something greater from within. Mm -hmm. And so really, really excited. You are someone I love to talk to, you know, as a friend and fellow coach and in this work and world. And, um, I'm excited to, to share you and to share what you're up to and what you've been doing. So thank you, my friend, for being here. Well, thank you. I'm excited to talk to you. Well, yay. I, I, I want to, you know, this is just a fun thing I've been doing is just rolling right away. Um, but I do want to give you a little intro so people can get a sense of who you are, what you're up to, what you've already, you know, I would say created and shared with the world and what you're working on. Cause I really believe in you. I believe in your work. I believe in your message. And, um, I can't think of a more important time than right now, uh, given what you're, what you're aiming to create and do. So I am going to just do a quick intro and, uh, I want to welcome all of you. My, my, just this amazing global USG, I think of you as family soul family, community. And uh, just so you know, you are part of a conversation today with just an amazing human being. His name is Colin. That's the one who left our, left the amazing intention. Colin Bevan, PhD, is a sought after coach. Colin is a speaker and consultant, as well as a Dharma master. I want to talk about that. He's a Dharma master in the Kwan Um Zen tradition. He attracted attention for his year-long lifestyle redesign project and the wildly popular book, No Impact Man, and the Sundance selected documentary film that it is inspired. He ran for the U.S. House of Representatives in New York's 8th Congressional District in 2012. I didn't realize that. Was the founder of the No Impact Project, a board member of Transportation Alternatives, an advisory council member of 350.org and a guest professor at Sarah Lawrence College. He is the author most recently of How to Be Alive, A Guide to the Kind of Happiness that Helps the World. Uh, Yes, please. And we'll have all of his links and everything after, but just to let you know now, he can be found at colinbevan.com and on Instagram at colinbevan. So, all right, let's there's a lot here. And I'd love to talk about, you know, for those that might be new to you. Maybe we talk about starting with your book, How to Be Alive. I, I, I'm not done with it, but I've read a lot of it, and I, I take it out. I take you with me in my walks, and I'm just, I'm really 
I love your style. I love how introspective you are. What was the impetus to write that? Maybe we can just start there. Cause I think right now with what you said, I think the question is how to be alive and how to be alive where you can feel that peace and connection and heart, but not lose that there's something we can do in such a crazy time. So, so how, so the book, how to be alive, it's subtitle is a guide to the kind of happiness that helps the world. So not just happiness for me, uh, most of us, um, most people I know, um, uh, once they get to this stage where their life is okay, they're, 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 there still feels like there's something missing because they're not connected to the world. Like they see that the, the world, it's like, it's like telling a joke. You tell a joke and you're the only person in the room that laughs, it's no fun. If you play a game and you're the only person that's having fun, it's, it's, it's worthless. And life is a little bit like that. Like uh, there comes a time where we are happy, we feel we feel good, um, but we see that the world around us is suffering. It doesn't. Um, it loses its uh, glitter for us. You know, we want we actually want to have a kind of happiness that also helps the world around us, our communities, our families, and the the, the planet itself. So that's what the book is about. The book comes out of. It's kind of a follow-up book to a previous project. Um, and that, that's, a pro that's a book um, that I wrote in a documentary film I was in called No Impact Man. No Impact Man was um, a project wherein my family, as it was comprised then, my then wife, myself, my daughter, our dog, we lived as environmentally as possible in New York City. So um, and in, 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 an, in an extreme way. And that project came out of the fact that I was already writing books, excuse me, and living in New York as part of the New York literary scene. But I myself got to that place where, sure, I was happy, I was fine, but I didn't feel that what I was doing was connecting to the suffering that I saw in the world. And I wanted to take my writing career and turn it over to help be part of and create it, uh, a discussion around this question, like how should we as human beings live how can we live in ways that where we where we help ourselves but also help others where our planet is not degraded through climate change where where somehow um, uh, uh, white people like me are not living at the cost of people of color and other communities um, where privilege and non-privilege are not so at odds with each other how do we how do we do that and so um, I wanted to be part of that conversation and so I came up with this idea of well. Um, I'll write this book, uh, No Impact Man, which was uh, an attempt to understand my relationship to climate change and the suffering in the world caused by kind of the consumer economy. And then when that book came out, it was kind of a big deal. It was covered by the press all over the world. It, the book was adopted as a common read. I started a nonprofit as a result of it and you know, consulted with international development banks and the United Nations and on and on. Um, uh, but everywhere I went, there was this question, but what about me? How do I connect to the world? How do I live a life where I feel safe and happy, but also feel like I'm making some meaningful impact on the world around me? Um, and that was what led me to, to write How to Be Alive, to help people to figure out for themselves. The thing about it is people kept asking me for directions. You know, what do I do? How do I con connect the dots? Um, but I believe that the, a big problem in our society is that we're all following directions. And actually what we need to be doing is connecting to ourselves, finding truth within ourselves and living that truth out in our relationship with our families, communities, planet, world. Um, and so that's what How to Be Alive is about. It's about who are you? How do you bring that out in a way that makes you happy but also serves the communities that you care about? I think this is a very, very important distinction, which is, and you were saying people looking to you. And I think, you know, coming from that place, so many people are, are coming from, I know I've been there where, what do I do? That's the question, right? How do I, how do I respond? What do I do? And what I'm hearing and what I got from your book and what you're saying is really when we look to others, it's taking that, that power away from that, your own connection and inner wisdom and, and going within and finding those answers. Um, and to do that work on yourself, within yourself, not just looking to others. 
I would actually like to go back for a minute because I'm realizing, I think for those that don't know Impact Man or maybe you've heard of it, I, I think just talking a little bit about, you said, and, and the and the little bit I've read and ex, just your experience, but I think you sharing, you said it was an extreme year, um, would love to get a day in the life. What was that like? What was that year like? What was the impact on you and your family? Do you feel like it... Um, created the impact you were hoping? I'll stop there because now I'm giving you like 20 questions, Colin. Yeah, so so New Impact Man was a, a pro project where it was, it was conceived, <laughs> it was structured in this way. Each, each month, we would address kind of an area of environmental impact and cut that out. So, so for example, the first month was about cutting out trash. Then the next month, month was about cutting out climate impact caused by transportation. The next month, was about um, uh, environmental impact caused by water use and degradation like this, right? So that we were kind of incrementally building a more and more environmental life, right? So um, uh, a couple of things were going on. First of all, if you asked an environmental scientist, is there such a thing as a person making no impact? They would say that it makes absolutely no scientific sense because you live in society, you live in a place where there's roads and schools and hospitals and, and you know, so even if you personally don't use any resources, you're making resources, it doesn't work that you can't. Um, what we tried to do also was we volunteered and tried to do good. So the idea was we reduced our negative impact and increased our positive impact um, and, and with the hope that it would come out as no impact. Again, Technically, that doesn't make sense. But really, there was this underneath kind of question, which is, can a human being live doing more good than harm? And what would it take to do that? Um, but it turned out that there was another question, because you know we were definitely media addicts, TV, cinema, um, uh, uh, eat, ate, ate food that wasn't really good for us. Um, all this, so all of that kind of went out the window, right? So um, but the TV used electricity, we got rid of it. Um, the food that we ate was transported from thousands of miles away, we got rid of that, right? So um, in place of the media that we ended up getting rid of to entertain ourselves, what we ended up doing is hanging out with our friends, socializing, emphasizing community. In terms of the food, what we ended up doing is eating good locally produced organic food. We got healthy. Um, so, so there is this question about what does it mean to be part of the consumer's machine? This idea, you know, go to college, get a mortgage, get a really good job, get married, have kids, save for your retirement, go on a cruise, die, die, <laughs> right? What does it, what does, what does that mean? And is that, is the way that it's carved out for us that we're directed to do it really good for us? Or, or if we actually do uh, be more conscious about these things, the food that we eat, the media we're consuming, is it possible that we might both be happier for ourselves, but also be building a life that's better for our communities around us? And, um, that, that, that was kind of a resounding yes. Like, like there were so many people always talk, ask like, well, how hard was it? Um, but the, I always think the, the better question is what gifts were given mm -hmm. um, and gifts that were given. Uh, for me, a big gift of that year is, is, is people often worry about how much media children are watching. Uh, but what I realize is that there's a bigger problem, which is how much media parents are consuming because when parents are consuming media they're not spending time with their children at least that was the case with me so the big gift for me of that year was I didn't really have anything to do but hang out with my daughter mm -hmm. and so I you know it set my at that time my daughter was um it was the project occurred from the time she was a year and a half to two and a half so it's to kind of set the tone for my entire re relationship with my daughter she's 17 now Right. So, yeah. So it. So that was a gift. Getting off the treadmill and actually beginning to recognize what, what felt actually important. Yeah. It's really that's it's powerful what you're saying, and I'm curious. I love the reframe or the looking at like what was the gift of that, and can imagine to have your daughter at such a young age kind of setting that tone. 
my question, I guess, not what was hard, but sometimes when we're so used to being on our screens or, you know, even I'm sure you got very clear how much trash we use when you stop doing that. Did you find, was there any kind of, I don't know how else to say, but maybe like detox period or aspect of just feeling, you know, kind of uneasy or was, was there a, a point of, of every month that, you know, I know you were focusing on something different. Was it, was it, um, how was it stretching you? Like, how was that, you know, to then I'm assuming, um, you know, trash, that would mean everything is either biodegradable or using, I would think just silverware, just, you know, right. So, 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 um, uh, living that way was time consuming. Mm. And, um, and, um, my job was to live that way because I had this book that I was writing and this film that I was making. So it was my got job to, so, so I had the time because I didn't have a different job. That was my job. Yeah. One thing that we, one, one, one of the things that kept coming up was, well, that's all very well for a privileged person like you, but how are the rest of us supposed to live that way? Yeah. Well, what was happening was we were kind of swimming against the current of society, like swimming against the current of the throwaway culture and redesigning our lives. But the truth of the matter is, is that this, this should not be an individual responsibility. The culture should be built in such, it should be built kindly, where dignity is given to all communities and the planet. And one person or one group of people should not be having to take responsibility. So in other words, to live environmentally, to live ethically should not be a, something that only a privileged person should do. So for example, the, our electricity should not be generated using fossil fuels. It should be generated using regenerative processes like solar and wind and tidal and all those types of things, right? So, so, so um, one thing that became very clear is that it shouldn't be a hardship for any one person to plug into systems that are sustainable and uh, equitable and just. That should just be the way our society runs. Yeah. So given what you're saying and the fact it's like, we're not there, <laughs> that's yeah. where we wanna move to. Cause the question I'm hearing people asking in this is, you know, where might I start? Where might my family start? Where might we start as a neighborhood, um, as a community? And yeah, where, where can we start? So, so that takes us to the book, How to Be Alive, because that's what, how to be, what, where do I start? Where do I fit in? That's what, and, and, you know, I want to say that How to Be Alive is not a book about how uh, we can pay penance for the consumerist world we live in or how we should sacrifice. It's actually about how do we choose, how do we choose a way of being um, where we get to, where we get to take, get taken care of, but we also feel like we're taking care of others, right? So that's this I say sometimes um, a good life is comprised of two things, security, you're not scared, you have the things that you need and meaning. You're, 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 you're actually making sure other people have those things too. Basically that's, it's, it's, that's how we work, right? We, 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 we find, we get what we need to be secure ourselves. And, and then we find meaning by offering that same security to others, right? So how to be alive is, is first it's, it's about understanding two things. It's about understanding yourself and then understanding the world that you in, that you live in. So who are you? What are your passions? What are your skills and talents? Like when you do, what, what things, when you do them, do you lose yourself to, right? How do you, what feels really important? Like you could be a numbers cruncher. You could be, a, you know, it could, it, it's not to say we're all supposed to be social workers. It's, a, it's, a, it's an honest question. Who are you, right? Mm -hmm. Then what, what is the world to you? That means what are the things that make you um, upset? What is it? What are the things that you care about? What are the concerns that you have? What do you, um, what do you want to help with? And then the next question is, how do you bring those two together? How do you bring 
you know, your, your, your most prized talents and passions and things you like to do together with the things that, that you care most about in the world. Um, um, there's, a, there's a quote by a, a Christian writer um, um, whose name is going to come to me as soon as we finish the interview. <laughs> I'm forgetting at the moment. But he said, um, God calls us to the place where our greatest passion meets the world's greatest sorrow, right? Mm. So, so what do I love to do? How do I do it in the world that helps what's, what's, what's troubling the world? That's where we're called to. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Mother Teresa said that, but I feel like I know exactly. I've read this. We'll find it's it. A, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Christian writer. It's a man. And like I said, it's going to come to me as soon as we hang up. As soon as we're done. It's all good. So well, I love these questions. And, you know, and it's interesting knowing your also background in coaching. And, and I would love to also talk about your, your work as a, um, as, a, as a Dharma master, your work in, in, in Zen as well. I, I think, you know, these are questions. It's funny here on this show, it's all about tuning into your you as to you. And I'm like, that is exactly the question, right? It's the, these, mm -hmm. these two questions, who are you? What lights you up? What makes you feel alive and, and purposeful and passionate? And then what feels important to you? Uh, what, what is the world to you? Like, how, how do you express that in the world? How do you bring that to the world? So I, um, I love these questions and I think these are not questions for people, you know, anyone listening, this is typically not something you just like rattle off. I think these need digesting and sitting with and really reflecting really upon, um, curious to know for you, Colin, how did, how, how does your work, um, in the Zen tradition, how has that, um, in the Zen tradition, how has, how has your work and your, your studying, maybe we can just move for a minute into your work as a Dharma master. How did you get involved or interested in, in, in that whole world? And how does exactly. that weave into this now? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 um, I've always uh, been skeptical about how the world ran. And also, you know, I, I, um, I, I, uh, seemed to me my family of origin, you know, my, my grandparents were very successful. My parents were very successful, um, in their own ways. Um, but, but things were rough. They weren't, you know, there were lots of ways in which they weren't happy. Um, and, um, and there was, I had a younger brother that died. I had an uncle who died. Um, and, um, um, so what I saw was a lot of people running around and chasing after things that didn't 100% matter. Like, I didn't know what the answer was, but it kind of left me with this hole, this question, you know, um, in my, in my twenties, I started to investigate, excuse me, that those questions I started to read, um, uh, mostly, um, about the mystical traditions and in, in all the great religions. So, excuse me. So, so, um, but there was something, um, I, I didn't like, which was, I didn't, I, it was this question of following directions. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't want to know how, um, I didn't want to know how the great um, founding teachers in our great religious traditions were so special that none of us could attain it. Um, what I wanted to know was how do how do I bring out that which was special about them within myself? You know, so I had a real sense of um, uh, 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 of the of the God within myself, the Buddha within myself, the Christ within myself, but I didn't know how to bring it out. Um, at the same time, all the questions that I had were, you know, are you supposed to like just get rich? Or are you supposed to stay poor and be a social worker? Like mm -hmm. which one are you, so, you know, those kinds of questions, like how are you supposed to make these decisions in life? And um, I, there was a way in which I wanted to kind of stop until I knew <laughs> like, 
like where where is that? so but i you know people would say if you keep asking those kind of questions you're going to drive yourself crazy mm-hmm. so i just i was traveling and somebody told me about this i was in providence rhode island and somebody told me about this korean zen master who he just said so there's a temple near here and there's a korean zen master that founded it and he likes to say you must wash your mind with don't know soap and there was just something about that that really appealed to me because, you know, so much intellect, so much thinking. Um, and I thought, what does it mean to wash your mind with don't know soap? Like there's something under underneath all those opinions and ideas, you know, something fundamental under there. I, I sense that. And I started to go um, and, and sit with this group and all those questions I had, you know, how do you live life? How do you, should you be rich or should you, you know, become a monk like which 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 what's the direction how do you tell um they didn't discourage me from answering the questions um in fact um they encouraged me to continue continue to answer them um and refuse to answer them for me Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. instead what they did was they gave me techniques and practices where i could stay in the inquiry um and um uh uh that suited me. That really suits me. This this kind of mystical practice where you stay in the question um, and stay in that not beyond just staying in the question, stay in the not knowing, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Right. Allow. Um, I, one of the teachers in my tradition says our practice is about becoming comfortable with not knowing, right? Mm-hmm. You know. So uh, then, when I don't know, when I'm when when I allow myself actually to not know and cut through my ideas and opinions, then I can respond clearly to what's happening in the world. Just like a tree sways naturally in the wind, right? Without the interference of some opinion about what direction it should move in. So, you know, if I, if, if I stay in not knowing, I also can respond naturally to the world. Mm-hmm. And underneath is some, uh, an article of trust. In fact, um, there's a there's an ancient poem called "Trust in Mind." It means that trusting this not knowing nature, that this not knowing nature, if you cut through the opinions and the fears and all of that, it already knows how to respond to the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so that that kind of informs all my work. I. I almost want to stay in this for a moment because I think what you're talking about is I've come at it from a little bit of a different angle. Um, it's so powerful what you're saying because what I'm hearing is really that it's that non-attached, no judgment, um, really staying in that. I believe the word is shoshin, right? That oh, that beginner's mind, that openness. That I love that. The no, don't know soap. <laughs> Wash your mm. mind with don't know soap. I love that that metaphor. Mm. Mm. Um, and what I'm hearing for all of us is what you've experienced, what you've studied is that when you, you get into that space of the not needing to know, not knowing, not trying to have, not needing to make some meaning, but just staying open, that there's something else, maybe of a higher intelligence, life force, greater possibility that comes through. That's what I'm hearing, which which um, I resonate with. Is that kind of, I mean, to me, it sounds like that ability to tap into something greater within you that's through you. Those are, those are the types of words that are typically talked about non-attachment, non-judgment. If you can stay open, then, um, then, then some side of power might move through you. Um, But to me, it's important that my experience is slightly different than those words. So so for example, non-judgment suggests that I don't have opinions and I don't have judgments. Mm. It's more like um, with practice, you come to understand your true relationship to your opinions and judgments. Uh, being And by... Uh, not and seeing that they're ephemeral, somehow you take them less seriously. So you're able to respond to what's in front of your face. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a, actually, that was a very helpful distinction. Um, and I'm curious too, just the whole, I guess the, the ability <laughs> to stay, to stay in that, that space, you know, observing, um, curious in the inquiry did, you know, how, where would you start, I guess, for somebody who's listening and would like to practice or try this staying, you know, this not knowing, um, mm. is it a series of questions? Is it asking the same question over and over again? Is it, um, what mm. would be, I love giving kind of like, you know, some action items. How can we use this mm. and do this? Because, um, yeah, how can we make this practical and applicable in our lives? Yeah. So Slowly pay attention as you breathe in. Pay attention as you breathe out. Make your exhalation a little bit longer than your inhalation. Let your consciousness fall down to the bottom of your stomach and watch your breath come in. And then watch your breath come out. And then sooner or later, if you watch that, you realize that you and your breath and the air they're not different. They're the same, right? So that, that's, that means that everything has the same substance, right? So if everything has the same substance, um, this, this, this everything having the same substance, it's, it's, this, it's the place from which our ideas and our judgments arise from. So you're following your breath in, you're following your breath out, Sooner or later, you realize, oh, you know, me and my breath are the same. And, and this is the place where my ideas and my opinions are coming from. But my opinions and my ideas are not fundamental. Mm. What is fundamental is this, um, this substance, this sameness about myself and this breath that I'm feeling coming in and out, right? It's before, it's, 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 it's before ideas and opinions, right? And it's clear clear like a mirror so that you know it's a the the when red comes it just sees red when blue comes it just sees blue when i'm hungry i eat when you're hungry i feed you right just starting from this simple place of breathe in pay attention breathe out pay attention beautiful thank you i could hear a question like give us that's that was really beautiful yeah and, and a great practice to just literally start there. Like, and you can even feel it as you were talking, Colin, just the, the simplicity, yet the, the like depth of connection, like it's all our breath, as you said, the air, it's all, it's the same and it's connected. So going back kind of to the, the, the basic building blocks and staying there, that's, that's what's foundational. That's what's fundamental. As you said, not the opinions, not your opinions and thoughts. Those can change, come and go. I'm really curious, you know, what, what's important to you now? What are you working on now? What's on the horizon? I know you've started your next book and would just love to hear like what, what's stirring your heart and your, your, your soul now. Yeah. So um, it's funny because whenever in my, in my, in my tradition, whenever somebody were to say, well, what's important to you now, where, where has life brought you to? What's it all for? It, it's, 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 it's sitting here talking to you. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. like, this is where life has brought me to. This is what's important in this moment. Yes. So, um, so um, that's always the first thing that comes up in my mind. Um, and it's also kind of like my practice. How do I actually bring my consciousness to this moment, assuming yeah. that the moments all unfold as they should. Um, but the other thing that's, that, that I'm thinking a, a lot about is that um, um, uh, we're in times where people are confused and scared. Um, and, and, and yet, um, and, and, and meanwhile, what's growing out of this is that a lot of people are asking though, I, I'm, I see that we're in confusing times, but I actually want to bring kindness into my life and my, you know, there, people are kind of like done with the unkindness, right? There are business, you know, lots of purpose-driven leaders out there 
uh, social enterprise. People are more and more interested in being parts of social enterprise. Um, there's the great resignation in which people won't put up with being treated badly by their employer. So there's this way in which there's there are, there seems to me to be an increasing number of people who want to emphasize receiving and giving kindness. So I'm starting to I'm starting to the, the the big question I have is what would it take for us to trust kindness, mm -hmm. right? To trust that desire to receive kindness, to trust the desire to give kindness, right? What does it take to trust that impulse? Um, because I think that that impulse is fundamental. We talked a minute ago about um, becoming one, and once you become one, then you can see through your ideas and opinions, and you can respond to the world. I think. When, when we're at that place, kindness is just actually, you know, the bodhisattva spirit, bodhicitta, that's the, it's fundamental to us. So how do we bring forth, how do we trust that which is fundamental about us? Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I've started to interview business leaders and, um, and, and trying to understand like, what, where can we bring kindness? Where can we use um, kindness as our North star? Um, in our lives and in our, in our and in our work, and what interferes with that, and how we can, how can we create conditions where um, where it's not interfered with? Yeah, this this is probably to me one of the most important questions to ask ourselves mm -hmm. to ask now. I, I would love to ask you, um, how do you how do what's your relationship with kindness like? How do you trust or not trust kindness? What does that look like? What does that look like today in your life? Mm, yeah. Well, am I being kind to you right now? I would definitely say so. Yeah, I would say so. Your internet's, <laughs> little, your internet's having a little issue. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah, my internet, say. my internet is not so kind. It's okay. Yeah. I don't take it personally. I'm giving her love anyhow. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. So, so it's 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 very interesting. This kindness to me, it's. I don't feel so scared. You know, I I. I, um, that's partly from privilege. That's partly from spiritual and emotional work. I, I do, um, you know, from our private conversations that certain fears do come up with me, but my, my general place is not one of fear. Um, and, and, and as I go through my day, I have a lot of security, meaning I feel secure within myself, you know? So, so my sense is that when a person feels secure, they're able to respond appropriately to what is. I hesitate to say that I'm particularly kind, and but and and I'm also I don't think that kindness is something we um, we we kind of um, choose to bring out. It's kindness is not doesn't always look like kindness. I I, I think the best way I can I talk to somebody who uh, runs an eco tourism business um, and. Um, they're they're doing amazing things um and then i said to them okay so how does this word kindness resonate with you and this person said not so much i preferred the word care like i care about the environment mm. um but then i realized like we also say we can also say i care about the environment and you don't care so i think you're an asshole <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so caring and kindness are different. There's something about, there's something, even if you say, talk about being deliberately kind, there's a way you can talk about it, but, but it only goes so far. There's some sort of a spirit of kindness that comes out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and um, so my, I think my relationship to kindness is basically one in which I try to create the conditions in my life where it can come out. I take care of myself. I take care of those around, around me. I ask myself the big questions. What am I? What's my place in the world? I allow myself to don't know. You know, um, I have a sense of, you know, some this universal substance flowing through my life. And so that makes me feel safe. And then I don't have to worry so much about kindness. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm, what I'm hearing, and I just takeaways for others is when it's, it, we're multidimensional, it's not just one thing. However, listening to you, Colin, what has worked 
works for you. I love that you kept bringing it back to the moment. So, you know, am I being kind right now? A great place to look is who are you right now in this moment? Mm. Um, and that general taking care of your, of your mind, body, spirit, you know, doing that in a way that what I'm hearing is it's, it's kindness to your soul. It's kindness to your mind. It's kindness to your body. That doesn't mean perfection. That doesn't mean <laughs> that you're a perfect human being. There is no such thing yet. There's an intention, which brings me back kind of how we started this whole conversation. The intention is kindness. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes while the aim might be to be kind to ourselves, many people struggle. And I know you, you, ha you have people you coach, high level executives and leaders, people that you coach around this. Oftentimes we might want to be kind, but there might be a belief or a, a programming or a, a way of being that where, you know, you're used to being shitty to yourself or, um, you know, self-deprecating, loathing, self-doubt. So, you know, to me, it's actually, as you're speaking about this, I just keep going to the systemic aspect of this, the start that the must start within, you know, I, I believe everything on the outside is reflecting the in the inner. Um, but I'm curious with your book, I know you've started it or just starting it just that, that looking at how are you in the inner world? You know, how are you being kind or not kind to yourself in, in the inside to yourself? You know, mm. how do you talk to yourself? How do you treat yourself? Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I'm going to say this is also how do you treat yourself, how do you respond to yourself has a lot to do with the work that I do with clients because so often what I find in my coaching work is that um, so we're all multifaceted individuals. We have many facets to ourselves and some parts of ourselves we like and prize and other parts of ourselves maybe we're more tentative about. Um, and um, a lot of very successful people have gotten to where they are by really relying on certain aspects of their character. So they say, you're very good. They say to those aspects, you're very good. You can be ahead. You can be in charge of my life. You're very good. And then to other parts of their character, you be quiet, you're bad. Um, and, and, and it's not that they've necessarily decided for themselves that this part is good, but that part is bad. It's that they've been rewarded from a very early age for these characteristics and somehow punished or ignored for these characteristics. So it's carried forward. And then, and then they get to a stage in their life where actually these wonderful characteristics that have gotten them so far can't get them further. Yeah. I was thinking, as, as I've, I've thought about it, it's like they've driven into a glorious, wonderful dead end, you know, <laughs> where so much about it is great and wonderful. Um, but the thing is, they, 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 they prize the forward uh, part of the gear shift and the reverse part, they don't want to use. They don't even want to acknowledge that they have it, right? So, so, so um, with my coaching clients, so often they have this resource inside them. They already, so often they already know what they, they need to do. They'll even say it, you know, I need to do, I need to do this, you know, I need to, um, um, I had a client, she just said, um, this is a quite famous person, great career, everything great on the outside, right? And um, and um, they needed to, to learn to say no, no to every, you know, they were just doing every, I just need to say no, but I can't say no, <laughs> right? So what you're asking about this kindness, being kind on to, um, to ourselves means actually to prize, to, to trust, the needs that are arising and the characteristics that are coming up. And even if they're not familiar to us, even if we've condemned those parts of us before to begin to trust them. You know, I have clients that are like, well, that, but that would be selfish, you know, they, they, oftentimes that put some, 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 something that they know they need to do, they call it selfish, right? But they don't trust that they're willing to, accept circumstances, but they're not willing to accept what goes on inside themselves. So um, kindness to oneself really means to me to put down the negative self-talk and allow those parts some movement. Mm. I was really just getting that nugget written down. I was really that, that I'm with you on that. Um, mm. I'm with you on that. This, you know, 
I have to say, and this is like not something that you change overnight or that you become aware of necessarily overnight. I know you've been doing some deep inner work for a while. Um, I love so many of these questions that came up today and, and introspective questions to really look like the one you said, what would it take to trust kindness? And you just kind of mentioned it again, trust is really kind of at the base of this to trust the needs that are, that are arising within you, even if you're not aware of them. I, before we wrap this conversation, although I have to say, I don't, I know when we have conversations, I never want to end because they're really deep and interesting. Um, I do always end with what I call asking about if you have a heart flare, I love to honor our heart and our desire to share anything. Maybe is there something that I didn't ask you or that is just right there for you that you'd like to, to share with the, with the community? Um, that feels like a heart flare, like your heart's like, let me share this before we end. I just like to give that option and opportunity if there's anything that's kind of coming up for you. I was, I mean, more like I continue to have momentum in the conversation that we have. So I like, and also, so, and I was just thinking um, about what we were talking about being kind to ourselves and working with clients and blocks and whatnot. Um, there's, there, there's this way that we can, move through the world trying to defend ourselves from, from what we're frightened of. And, um, um, and sometimes, the, sometimes we're defending ourselves against things that have already happened. You know, people won't like me if I behave like this. Well, that, that actually happened years ago. People didn't like you when you behave, but it's not happening now, right? This type of thing. So, so, so to trust means in some ways to let yourself be more naked and to put, to, to let the defenses go down a little, like how can we move forward being less defensive? I think in my own life, in my own life, you know, what am I, when I'm not acting in accord with how I want to be acting, it's because I'm defending against some future danger that, probably isn't there. Yeah. This brings me back to what you were saying, even when I said, <laughs> what's on the horizon? What do you think? And you said, you know, well, what's happening right now mm. is what's happening on the horizon, meaning bringing us back. I mean, I could hear this multiple times a day. I think especially for those listening that tend to be future thinkers, visionaries, thinking, you know, a lot of us do that, right? Project into the future, sometimes positive, sometimes negative outcomes. And what I keep hearing is keep coming back to now, let your defenses down to be, I love that, to, to be naked, to be open, to be, as you said, not knowing in the right now. Yes. Amazing. Colin, I just, I, I so appreciate who you are in this world, what you're up to. I love these questions. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing more about you and your powerful work and your words. And I really highly recommend, I mean, I, your book, um, how to be alive is, and I know you how to be alive, a guide to the kind of happiness that helps the world. I love that. I want to get the Second part, correct. Um, and I know you're an author of three other books. You're working on this book now on kindness. You have the documentary, No Impact Man and Zen Master. I mean, you know, hey, it sounds like, you know, imperfectly, you are just, I appreciate you and what you are choosing in the moment to moment uh, to be. To me, this is about, you know, honoring your USU. And I, I'm, I'm grateful to call you a friend and colleague and just really to illustrate, you know, some of these deeper questions that we can all take in and digest. And hopefully, as you said in the earliest, you know, we began in the intention to really look at, okay, how can I really get to know who I am, what matters, and how can I do, do something that intertwines with my passion and what the world needs. So I just want to thank you. Thank you, Julia. It's really nice to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd love to thank you, my dear listener and community for being here. This uh, conversation 
may it elevate your thinking, your consciousness, your way of seeing yourself. I hope you really do take in some of these really powerful, very deep and meaningful questions. As always, they will be in the show notes. Um, but I'm hoping that like all of our, all of the episodes, this one in particular really allows you to go to go at a, at a new depth within yourself and to be present in this moment and to have, uh, as, as Colin said, to wash your mind with the don't know soap. Love that. So I'll leave you on that note. And thank you for, for being here with us.